does New York plan to protect itself? What infrastructures could prevent this extraordinary city from disappearing under the sea? It's a very tough moment, but I think it's time to start asking some of these harder questions. Since the hurricane in 2012, the entire city has been preparing for battle. You need a stress or an event such as a hurricane to make sure that the city will be ready for the next time. The city of New York launched an unprecedented design competition, investing nearly $1 billion. It was a very simple functional question. How do we protect ourselves? And then it was a site-specific question. How can New York improve itself by protecting itself? If the vast majority of the scientific community is anywhere close to right, then we have a problem we need to solve. Architects and engineers from all over the world set to work to find solutions, what we call resilience. I think of it like a boxer, right? Um, you have two people fighting, somebody gets a big hit. Your ability to take the hit and not fall down is called resistance. It's how much you resist the disturbance. But if you do fall down, if you get knocked down, how fast do you get back up? That's resilience. The first matter of urgency, protect Lower Manhattan. The zone was hit particularly hard by Sandy. Wall Street even had to shut down for two days, resulting in huge financial losses. That something like this should happen again is simply out of the question. So it's simply the finances, um, the shutting down of the city, just the logistics of what it means for the, the heart of, of so much capital and so much banking and so much business would be shut down is, would have a huge impact on the world. One of the brilliant ideas that won the competition is a U-shaped protective barrier stretching 12 kilometers around Lower Manhattan. It's called the Big U. The barrier is not a simple concrete wall. It takes on different forms to fit each neighborhood's needs. If you're in the east side of Manhattan, there's much more open space. And you say, maybe in this case, a levee makes much more sense. Uh, it's cheaper. Uh, it works with the park next to it. And so you start to look at all the menu of different options. And so it changes. The entire length is a combination of the best selected pieces of flood protection. In some spots, it will be an artificially created berm. There'll also be levees. In other areas, hills will be created to accentuate the topography and protect it. The flood protection needs to come up to a certain elevation, right? So you know that in 2050, if there's a storm like Sandy, it has to be 16 and a half feet above sea level. So if, even if it's a wall, if it's a gate, if it's a berm or a levee, it has to come up to 16 and a half feet. If you do that, you know that it's gonna protect any of the water from coming into the city. The Big U's flagship project, a deployable wall to provide a barrier against waves. It will be attached here to the underside of the FDR, an elevated highway that runs along the East River. So imagine above this is the FDR, right? Technically, this works in a very simple way. When the storm is coming, say, 24 hours before, someone comes along and they turn these down. What they would do is they'd have a, a motor attached to the, ba the base, and it goes zzzz, and slowly this thing comes down. The wall, three meters high and two kilometers long, will swing down to block the water and prevent the waves from surging into the city. The rest of the time, the wall is flipped up so the ground space can be used recreationally. The ground is where people want to be, and having a wall in the middle of that would destroy their relationship to the water and the use of this, the space on the ground. So by having something that could actually flip up actually means that you keep the best part of the city while also making it fully functional. The work is set to begin in 2019. Total cost of the project, $335 million. However, the barrier may not be enough because back when the city was being built, certain mistakes were made. Mistakes that New York pays a high price for in today's changing climate. 
What if a tiny creature, just a few centimetres long, could save the city? A small shellfish that's become the new hero in the world war against climate change. In the southwest of the city is Staten Island, one of New York's five boroughs. The island was ravaged by Hurricane Sandy. 24 people lost their lives to the waves. But here, it's impossible to build a wall. In Staten Island, you're dealing with a very, very residential fabric. And building a wall with such a low density wouldn't make sense, both from a risk reduction standpoint, from an economic standpoint. And so another amazing project, which also won the city's design competition, consists of establishing oyster beds in the bay. These small shellfish can reduce wave energy. Actually, it's a little known fact, but until the 19th century, New York was the oyster capital of the world. New York City had an immense natural oyster production. Today, we talk about New York as the Big Apple. But at the turn of the 19th century, we could easily have called it the Big Oyster. That's how characteristic oysters were to the economy here. You know, in New York, you have like hot dog and food carts. So you can get a hot dog on every street corner. Back then, it used to be oyster carts. So people would stop walking in the street to buy oysters and have oysters on the street. But today, with pollution and overfishing, oysters have disappeared from New York Bay. And yet, the shellfish played a primordial role, particularly in Staten Island. You know that there, like, there was a place on the south shore of Staten Island, there was an oyster reef, and you can see in the geologic record that it used, that used to protect the, the shore. And then once that reef got reduced because of overfishing, then the shore became more vulnerable to, to overwash events and storm, storm surge. Why not look to the past for inspiration and recreate these famous oyster reefs? The problem is, the water in the bay is still polluted. There's no way oysters could grow on their own. They need help. These huge artificial breakwaters, built about three meters high out of stone, will be coated in a special ecological concrete and planted with oysters, which in time will colonize the entire structure. Oysters come together in oyster reefs. It looks like coral reefs, basically. So they come together, they build those natural reefs. When one oyster dies, there is another one coming on top of it. And so those reefs keep building up. The nine breakwaters, 300 meters off the coast and stretching over a kilometer, will eventually function like this. As powerful waves crash over the top of the breakwaters, the structure's porosity will absorb the water and lessen the wave's energy. Coastal damage is therefore reduced. The oyster projects are as much to do with the healthy ecology of the region as with storm protection. So I think that, that it's true that any kind of, of, of um, planting or wetlands or islands or or oyster reefs, all of that contributes to the reduction of the storm energy before it hits the coast. But in the long haul, the oysters are also really good as a, a, a symbol of the health of the estuary. Because these tiny mollusks have an amazing property. Each day, a single oyster can filter 200 liters of water all by itself. The water in these two containers is very dirty. Oysters have been placed in the one on the right. The result is astounding. After just a few hours, the water is nearly transparent. New York Bay could soon be cleaned in the same way. It's a snowball effect, and the more oysters you put, the better the water quality gets, and the more oysters will be able to survive in the future. The first breakwaters are scheduled for late 2018. But beware of food poisoning. New York's Fine de Claire won't be fit to appear on the menu until 2050. It's an ambitious project, no doubt, but is it enough to save the city? Because New York thought it was indestructible and has been quite reckless over the centuries. For instance, the city has actually expanded right into the water. 
and in storms, the people living in these zones are obviously the first to be affected.